So when I went to university, I think it was my first or second week when I was in school, I was actually walking down a hallway and someone came up to me and they said, Hey, would you like a credit card? And I was like, of course I'd love a credit card. Why, who wouldn't want a credit card? And this is my, you know, first time living on my own first time away from home. And I signed up for this credit card and you were like pre-approved. I think it was like a $500 limit. And, uh, I signed up for it. And then I think in the first month or two, I decided to use it and I spent maybe $200. And so then I actually spent this $200 and about, you know, three, four weeks later, I get a bill in the mail says, Hey, you owe $200. Here's what the interest is going to be. Here's your minimum payment. And I actually said, well, I don't have enough money to pay the whole thing back. So I'll just wait. I'm not going to pay the minimum payment. Why would I pay? You know, I think it was like $10 or something like that. And so I didn't pay it because I didn't know anything. And, uh, the next month it's like, Hey, uh, here's what you owe plus interest that has now accrued. Here's your minimum payment, which is more than it was the prior month. And I hadn't spent anything more. I was like, eh, that's okay. I don't have all the money. I'll pay it next month. And then I think the third month, there was more of a like final notice letter that came my way. And basically I didn't pay that minimum payment because I just assumed that it was actually better to pay the whole thing and it, it, you know it, it pay the whole thing at once and i thought the company would appreciate that and basically within the first three months of university on my own i had destroyed my credit for the next seven years because i didn't know any better and that was something that really made me think and i always think about this in terms of our students and do our students walk out of our schools knowing this stuff and you know my parents taught me some things about financial literacy but obviously not about credit cards. So that was something that was actually missing. So when we, I had this conversation with Dr. Will Dianport, we talked about education. We talked about, um, you know, opportunities for students, um, you know, in classrooms, how we utilize technology, but we really got into this conversation about fi financial literacy, not only for our students, but for educators as well. And I think a lot of times, you know, in my career, I was like kind of dependent just on a pension at some point. And, you know, I started reading and, you know, started thinking about different ways uh, to kind of think about that. So it's a really interesting conversation. I wasn't one that I was actually expecting, but I know a lot of people will be interested in this. And if you have questions or, you know, things that you'd like us to dig it into more, I, I, I'm really interested in this stuff. I'd love to um, maybe talk more about it. So just maybe throw them in the comments on YouTube. Uh, you might be listening to this on SoundCloud, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, but if you could, um, if you do have questions, write them down and then go over to the YouTube channel and um, and write them because I'd love to hear what your questions are and uh, how we can assist. And Dr. Will has a lot of great ideas, a lot of things to think about. Um, really push my thinking, open up some ideas for me, but I really hope you enjoy uh, this episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, it's George Kuros and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I actually have someone on the show today that I've known forever through social media, but actually have never had the chance to just kind of sit down and chat. We got to chat a little bit before uh, we started the podcast, but Dr. Will Diamport, and I'm I'm hopefully saying that correctly, and uh, I asked him how he likes to refer to, and he just said Will, but you know, I kind of just know you as Dr. Will, right? Like I I've known you as Dr. Will forever, so I'll probably just call you that the whole time. Um, Dr. Will is an instructional technologist. He does a ton of stuff with social media. He's actually created a documentary that you can actually uh, get online at Vimeo. It's called The Edgepreneur, and we're going to talk about that. And I'm just really excited just to kind of sit down and talk to you because like, I've been following your work. I know that we've connected several times, but uh, Dr. Will, thanks for being on the podcast. If you could just tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do today, and how you got there, that'd be a great way to start. Oh, thanks. Uh, George, it's been a uh, it's been a long time, and uh, especially if you know to actually like sit down and I guess virtually and speak with you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Will Damport. Uh, I've been an instructional technologist. This is my ninth year. Yeah, uh, with my school district. And I've been doing this work and working with uh, teachers on how to implement technology and to uh, teach online or in a blended environment. Uh, we 
soon after I got with the district, we went one to one with uh, devices and Schoology at the secondary level. And then we had one elementary school that we worked with uh, like that. And then, of course, we started to bring in more devices. And then like everyone else, when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. we were like, OK, now, now let's move everyone on the school easy so we can have one platform and, and do certain do things a certain way so that's pretty much what i've been focusing on these past uh i guess two years as everyone else uh, to, to get teachers to really sort of reimagine uh what what they can do with technology mm -hmm. uh, in the classroom as well as to meet students where they are and i know a lot of times when we say meet kids where they are the first thing people talk about is some sort of tech score or diagnostic, yeah. right? And I tell them meeting kids where they are now also includes meeting them online because that's where they are. Right. I mean, how many times have you gone to a grocery store and you see some kid with a tablet or a phone and they're just sitting there? Like, so I didn't have that as a kid. You know, if you had anything, yeah. some kind of little that made a lot of noise, but you got little kids now literally with devices in, in their hands at smaller ages. And so they're online already. They're interacting. <clears throat> they're living there. They're doing a lot of things. So I'm trying to get you to understand that part of that meeting them where they are is meeting them in their own space and what they're already, you know, doing and accustomed to. And so along with that, uh, I'm doing uh, writing and consulting and uh, on social media, you know, trying to push the conversation forward about online learning, mm -hmm. uh, as well as financial literacy and, and entrepreneurship, because I'm all about creating multiple streams of income, uh, particularly when we're as educators. And I know this is a stick a subject for some folks, but yeah, you know, our salaries, particularly in the United States, our salaries are set by two things, and that is your state, and you can get a local supplement, and then it is pretty much characterized by, okay, how many years of experience you have yeah. and what kind of level of education you have. And that's pretty much it. You can't take that evaluation they give you, right? You can't take right. that observation and say, by the way, you're going to get right. a couple of extra thousand on there because uh, you said I was outstanding, you know? Yeah. But if you worked at Google and somewhere and someone said you were right. outstanding, you could turn that into some extra money. Uh, so, you know, part of my thing is talking to educators about not only how do you manage your, your money in a certain way and to, to keep it and to grow it, but bring in an extra income instead of working yeah. at a retail store. How about doing what you're already doing in terms of your classroom knowledge and sort of turning that into some sort of business venture uh, for yourself? So that's pretty much uh, what I am or, or what have I've been doing uh, these past uh, few years. Well, there, I got about 10 million questions I have <laughs> based yeah, on your introduction. So uh, I actually I'm, I actually wrote down the financial literacy because I yeah. it's something I'm really interested in as well. And I I it's um, um and we'll talk about it. But it's like I think it's kind of a I don't know if it's a weird thing because it's education, but it's kind of like um, it's maybe it's a generational thing. Like we kind of grew up, you know, kind of like, Hey, don't talk about money. And I think there's more of awareness of it. Cause you know, it is partially to kind of support others, you know, in their own pursuits mm -hmm. of what they're doing as well. But the one thing that you said that I thought was um, interesting, well, you said a lot of things that were interesting, but the one thing that really kind of stuck out to me is kind of thinking about how kids are at a certain place um, with, you know, what they do with technology and how do they utilize this and when I was thinking about this, you said, basically, you know, you've been with the district for nine years, you were using devices right away. Um, you know, as, as you're kind of going in there, pandemic happens. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you think it was like, did you, did you feel at any point, maybe the kids were maybe more comfortable going to remote learning spaces than maybe sometimes the teachers? Or um, did you put, you know, were teachers way more comfortable because you had a lot of training? Like, how did you kind of see that? I, I got, like, we always talk about kind of the teachers transitioning. Mm -hmm. How are the students? Like, I'm, I'm actually curious about that because, you know, you, you do make a really good point that a lot of kids were very comfortable with this technology. But I think they're comfortable using it, but not necessarily comfortable seeing it as a learning device. Right. Like, yes. not seeing the power of it. So, like, how did you see that transition with kids through that process? Well, 
<clears throat> some kids perform well mm-hmm. and some kids did not. I mean, everyone is not going to take the online learning the same way, just like in a face to face environment. One of the issues that I saw happen right away was, and this happened all around the country. <clears throat> students were told, remember we first went remote. Students were told, this is not going to count. Right. Right? Yep. So you can't tell a kid at the house that <laughs> right. this is not going to count, right? right. Uh, when they already have, they're at home. They already have their phones, the tablets, video games, etc. Right. Okay, now you got a problem. Right, you you got a problem because mm, you're gonna have a certain amount of kids who just at that point they're just not gonna show up, and so this is this happened all over the country uh, with that. But I, I also you have to look at how did certain teachers organize mm-hmm. their courses, right? Now some teachers made sure that they checked in with kids. What I mean by that is they didn't just talk. For 45 minutes, right? They made sure that they were checking in with kids. They were kids were doing stuff with them. Right. So that kept kids engaged. That kept kids, you know, being active and instead of just sort of like, all right, I'm just gonna show up or not show up or whatever. Uh, you know, some teachers did, you know, again, they did very interesting things. They didn't try to just take what they would normally do online, you know, in a face to face and just try to, okay, how can I fit this in online? And then sometimes the schedule was off, right? Like some teachers, they tried to run that bad boy eight to three. Right. Right. And I'm like, mm, <laughs> yeah, mm, does that work? No, nope. mm, mm, mm. I told teachers don't do that. I said, listen, you need to, ha- in terms of your direct instruction, those things that, that needs to be a good, 20 minutes mm-hmm. right very solid instruction from there be available to your kids right so when your kids are doing the independent work be still you know still be in a zoom and work with with any students that come up and say hey i need help with x y and z have breakout rooms where you can actually work with kids uh based upon various needs where you can group them but if you think you're going to spend 60 minutes in a Zoom and just talk to kids all day, mm-hmm. you're going to get tired of that. And at some point, right. your kids are going to get tired of it and they're going to stop showing up. Well, you know, the one thing that I, I really think is really important to kind of emphasize is, and, you know, I do a lot of speaking and things like that too. And, you know, I got an hour, right? Like they gave me yeah. an hour, right? And, one of the things that I really try to do is that within that hour, probably like the first five, 10 minutes, I just try to build rapport with the audience, mm-hmm. especially in a virtual space. And, you know, I, I remember one time getting a comment like, hey, like I'm not here to like get to know you or anything like that. I just came here to learn, which is like the anomaly, I think, right? Mm-hmm. And for me, the thing that I always say is that it's like, if you think about a 45 minute period, it's better if you spend time building like connections with students during 10, 50 minutes and have like 30 minutes of like, you know, learning as opposed to 45 minutes of no one listening to you, right? Like that, that, yeah, that yeah. and that's what tends to happen, right? If you don't actually build that rapport and you don't build those connections, you might get the full 45 minutes, but no one was actually listening to you during that time. Um, the other thing that, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about, and this is kind of, what, you know, why I love kind of talking before um, we get into this, uh, that, that notion of, you know, when we lose students, when we say, hey, like this is not being graded or, you know, we're not going to do this too. I think there's an issue with the sense that kids will only do stuff if they say it's graded, which is like, so what's, so then is the purpose of school to just do like a checklist to move on to the next thing? Or do kids actually find their purpose in school? And I think that to me is like, so how, how do you kind of deal with that when, you know, sometimes we, we use kind of carrot and stick uh, reasoning for, for kids to actually do things in our class. But then when those are, when those things are taken away, then, you know, we're, we're, sometimes we can't be as effective, but maybe we're focusing on 
the wrong process, right? Like one of the books I really loved was uh, Dan Pink's Drive. I highly recommend it. It really changed my thinking about uh, motivation and, you know, helping people find purpose and, you know, including myself. So how do you, how do you, how do you see dealing with that? Cause I know you mentioned about really kind of helping kids find purpose before we even started the podcast today. Yeah. You, you, you have to get away from the test being the be all end all, right? Mm-hmm. Because, because the States do that and they'll punish you for, you know, quote unquote failing or whatever. Yeah. Then that just trickles down to yeah. a lot of school districts just making that's their metric right there right uh that's the number one metric is what are our test scores looking like and that is un, you know, i mean that's unfortunate uh and then you have other school districts who you know they'll pump the chest out like we're ranked number one look right. there, look there, look there. Right. again it's based upon again this whole idea of a test score and not in whole not centered around what are kids learning? How are they learning? Are they excited to come to school every day? Are kids leaving high school with a mission, right? And I understand right. it's eight, they're 18, right? And things are going to change. I mean, look, you, yeah. you can be 30 years old. And at some point in time, look, I've had this job for so many years. It's time for something else. So I'm not saying this is permanent, but kids need to leave, leave in my opinion, with high school with some sort of big, right hairy idea of something they want to do achieve accomplish and that is just you you don't get that when the test score is your driving you know measurement right because you're not going to be teaching in a certain way you're going to be buying curriculum that's aligned to this because this curriculum is quote unquote based upon data metrics is what's going to get you to that test score. Right. And it, it, so, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because when you, like when, if you asked like 99% of administrators, like what the purpose of school is, you know, they'd be like, we want to develop lifelong learners. We want to do this. But then when you look at the actions, it's like, so the kids will do good at tests. So that will make, yeah. like, if you actually, it not, not what they say, what the actions align to, right? I remember actually being in a state and, uh, the state commissioner, I can't remember, was like, I think that was what it was called. Uh, I'm not going to say the state because I don't want to like out it, but they were like saying, and I'm from Canada, right? So I can, I'm kind of like, I can say whatever I want to this person, right? Because I'm not going to be in trouble because what are they going to do? Kick me out of Canada, right? So they, uh, so they were talking about, you know, a lot of the things that I talk about. And they were talking about, you know, helping kids find purpose, you know, really deep, meaningful learning, you know, building relationships. And so I talked to this gentleman after I said, Hey, I love the stuff that you're saying. Will the actions from your government department actually align and coincide with that? Or are you just saying nice things to a group of teachers to make them feel good? But then when you're away, it's all going to be about what are state test scores? You know, and I, I think part of, I think part of the issue that we deal with in education is, you know, it is a tax funded profession. And there's a feeling that there's accountability measures in there. And the easiest way to build accountability is just to use scores, right? It's just super easy to do that. And I think that part of the equation is we have to kind of say like, okay, how do we know that we're doing right by our mission? How are we doing this? And understanding that not everything that can be easily measured is actually important, right? Or or is is not necessarily unimportant, I guess, uh, for for better terminology. So I think that to me is, is something that, like if you, I, I think part of it too is like, what do we say and what do our actions align have to coincide as opposed to being two totally opposite things? Because like, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you've heard it before. Maybe some people just say, Hey, look, I don't really care about anything else. These kids got to do well in these tests and that's the driver. Right. And I don't think it's an either or I just think de- if you develop learners, they'll be fine on the test. But if you develop great test takers, that doesn't mean they'll be good learners. And I think that, I think that to me is uh, the the connection there. Yeah, and 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 as to your point, no one out, no one says that. Like, go right. to any school's right. mission statement, and you're not going to see right this score, this on the state test, right? No, 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 you know, no. But you know, they talk about the lifelong learning. They talk about you know right. uh, all these things. But again, the internal conversations that happen. This is where you get you talking about the test scores. Now, here 
aside from, to me, the problem with this in terms of it impacting what happens in the classroom, because because everyone at this point, it's about a script. Right. It's about, X, you know, we're going to follow this at this time. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do that is what happens when your kids graduate because okay let's so let's say your kids now go on to some sort right. of post secondary institution where there are no state tests yeah right so the professor then they have their own problems as well cuz i don't i don't believe in the all day you know super lecture and people just right. quiet and hear you talk right. all day but in that environment that's a whole different type of 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 learning where you as a student have to really take control of your learning, mm -hmm. right? So you have to choose your classes and think about how do these classes meet career goals or yep. life goals or all these things and and put in that extra work that you never had to do in most uh, K-12 through institutions. And when stuff is sort of in K-12 through sort of handed to you, because yeah. again, we want that test score, that test score. Right. What happens to you at the higher at the high, in higher education when the, there is not there? You get a syllabus. Now your professor could remind you on October fifteenth that papers do. Right. They don't have to because they gave you the syllabus. Yeah. Right. And so, how are we preparing kids for the next level? Either that, or even the world of work, where again there's a certain type of accountability that's expected. So if your schedule mm -hmm. says you show up at eight o'clock for your shift. You got to show up at eight o'clock for your for your shift, and right. so I just truly believe that education. We got to do some things because we know it, the system was created. We we know for a factory model because at that time we we're talking about agrarian society, blah blah. blah. Then yep. we started to move into a more industrialized society with manufacturing, and they wanted to create a certain type of worker. Yeah. We don't have that sort of economy anymore. And I think we need to blow up the whole notion of kids need to sit in roles. Kids need to uh, be based upon grade levels by quote unquote ages, mm -hmm. all those things. And I really do think at some point, you know, maybe you started at sixth grade, but you, some kid has to fill out some sort of uh, academic plan. Where they say, I'm interested in these things. I have, these are three or four career goals that I want to have. Again, I'm not beholding some right. sixth grader to a right. life of this. Right. But then allow them and have the school set a set of courses around that where kids can kind of go in, find themselves, and do work that is meaningful to them, right? Mm -hmm. Do work where they're taking that phone, they're taking that Chrome, they're taking that iPad, right. and they're creating things and they're working on things and they're doing all these different things again to make learning personal to discover ideas uh, to do all these things to where as they are learning and things are sort of starting to gel with them and they're synth synthesizing information they have a <clears throat> not a, a greater confidence in themselves but they have a greater sense of purpose of about what they want to do mm -hmm. well, and Go Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go. And I'm just saying, like, you know, of course, things can change. You can graduate from high school thinking, hey, I'm 18. I want to be this and get on that college campus or start to work and go, mm, I want to do a little something else. It right. happens. But at least don't have people graduate rudderless. Well, the, the and this actually ties in beautifully with what I wanted to talk to you about next is the, the notion of financial literacy, because I think yeah. a lot of times what we do with our students is we we prepare them to go work for other people, yeah. right? As you know, like in compliance is an important thing if you're working for other people. I think that's that's kind of the things. And one of the things that I really want to develop is that how do you actually help students not just look for opportunities, but create them, right? And 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 I think that's a huge shift in thinking uh, in what we're doing. And like, I, I actually work with someone right now uh, and he's in his mid twenties and kind of talking about some, he, he's, you know, a bit of a wants to be an entrepreneur, but he's kind of, kind of in this mold of, you know, like it's all about me working for somebody else, you know, me dependent upon 
you know, that person specifically. So I'm curious about, you know, some of the stuff that you're doing with financial literacy I'm, and like, are you doing this with students? Are you doing this, you know, with educators? Are you doing it both? So what are some of those opportunities that you're seeing and, and, and how we're looking at financial literacy and with educate, with education? I'm doing it with, with educators. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. definitely an evangelist for kids. And I talk about it on Twitter. Right. I've written about it. Uh, for Schoology Exchange, uh, you we have kids who graduate from high school because for a lot of states, financial literacy is not a mandated course. Right. So you'll have kids graduating and they don't know how to open up a, a checking account. Right. They don't know anything about credit. They don't know anything about uh, budgeting, uh, taxes. How do you buy a house? Right. You know, ba- simple things about investing. Right. Those are our key skills that they need to learn. And part of and, and then at the college level, they need to be, be gotten there because part of this, again, financial literacy, not only knowing these things, but w- what are your your, your values mm-hmm. around money and understanding your psychology around money and, and looking at your home, your background, uh, your community, the, the, the experiences you've had, because. You could be someone who because of a lack of again understanding what of what these numbers work and the psychology about money your values you could very well be- become an nba player and over the course of a 10 year career make 200 million dollars and 5 years after retirement you're broke antoine walker do you know that name <laughs> yeah you i do know him, him. Yeah, I, do. Yeah. I, I wasn't thinking of him when i said that but yes i think that i think i'm i think that happened to him right uh, Antoine Walker was someone yeah. who made hundreds of, or I don't know about hundreds of millions, but like yeah. more money than, you know, we'll ever see, but then eventually yeah. it was broke. Right. Yeah. And it happens. Right. And so yep. that shouldn't, should not have happened. Right. And you have people mm-hmm. who are making six, you know, mid six figures, which again, and Cal, you know, in, in LA and San Francisco and New York, right. mid six figures, you're not, you know, making it rain anywhere, but you should not be living paycheck to paycheck. Right. But they are because, again, they lack the financial literacy of understanding how do I spend my money and, and understand this, the psychology behind all, you know, your, your financial decisions mm-hmm. and, and understanding how to make better decisions. Right. And so along with that, as you mentioned earlier, I'm all about teaching kids about entrepreneurship. Now, whether you become an entrepreneur in terms of opening a business, you should become an, an entrepreneur and understanding that you are a business of one. And what do I mean by that is, mm-hmm. let's say let's say you're an educator. You go to your district and you soak up every piece of PD they offer. If it's letters training, if it's order getting ham, if it's schoology, if it's cams, whatever, you soak it up and you take those skills, you make them applicable to what you're doing and you put them aside in your toolkit, right? You are a business of one. And when your district no longer serves you, right, don't be afraid to leave and go somewhere else and you take those skills that you've learned from them for free somewhere else. Now, whether that becomes you starting your own consulting company you're going to go work for Canvas as, as a, a trainer for them. Uh, or you just move again, move on to another school district where their values more align with yours or where, where you can see a, 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 a clearer path for growth for yourself. You do that. But we have educators as well as other workers who languish in jobs. Right. Because they get attached to the job. They get attached to the paycheck and not understanding as a business of one you actually are in control of where you go because your employer will let you go when it is best suited for them. Right. Or if, for example, a school district, which, you know, normally we don't, you know, school districts normally are not the places where you hear about a lot of uh, job cuts. However, when budget cuts come, you could be the one on the chopping block because they don't have the money for your salary. Right. You know, so uh, this might get, I might be getting a little bit into shady territory right now, but this is, the, I'm going to drop some truth bombs. Uh, one of the things that is really predominant is that the amount of teacher salaries in education 
has actually not increased as much as central office salaries. And I'm not, and I'm actually talking about like how much support staff and there's more and more staff going into a central office by percentage than it is teacher shortages. Right. And I think a lot of times the reasoning for that is because the superintendent central office, and this is where I might get in trouble or say this, but it's true. They, they, if they're stressed and they control the budget and they think, you know, I'm super stressed. I feel this every day. I can hire more people to lessen the, what I have in my own school or in my own, like for my own work, but then they don't necessarily actually realize the stress that's being caused by, you know, in the, in classrooms and staff, they don't necessarily, you know, make sure like, Hey, let's, let's, let's equal this out. And I think some places around the world, they're saying like, Hey, we got to like ease up on the admin, uh, amount of salary, the percentage that it's going up to. Right. And, um, the, the, the thing that you, there's, I, I got so many, I'm just writing notes like crazy while I'm talking to you. Um, there's actually a really great story and uh, hopefully I can find it and I'll share it in the description down below if it's there, but it was actually about a custodian, uh, who basically, um, I think never made over 40,000 a year or something like that. It was like a, you know, that was like their, maybe their top end salary. And then when they retired, had like, you know, basically $5 million. Uh, from their retirement. And it was just basically how they invested and how they went through that compound interest and things like that too. Um, which is, which is really interesting because I think so I remember, you know, I remember actually in the, in my early, uh, times of education, someone coming to, um, a session and saying like, Hey, here's how compound interest works. And, you know, like if you invest, you know, just this amount, you could have this much and you're like, whatever, like you just think they're lying. And they don't necessarily show you numbers, but you kind of have that, you know, but then you maybe regret, you know, 10 years from now uh, to do this. And I remember the the thing that I think is really important is when I went to college, I remember this distinctly. It was like my first week in a new city, new place. And someone came up to me and said, hey, do you want a credit card? I'm like, yeah, of course I want a credit card. Yeah, that'd be great. And they're like, it's got a $500 limit and, you know, this is really good for you. I'm like, that'd be great. And so I remember I probably spent, I was like, um, oh, you know, I'm like out of money this month. I'm going to use my credit card. So I put, probably put like $200 on it. Right. Something like that. And, and then I got like a, a bill from the credit card saying like, Hey, here's how much you owe. Here's the minimum payment. And I was like, eh, I don't actually have the full amount. So I'm, I'm just, I'll just, I'll pay it like in three months. So I didn't even pay the minimum payment. And then I get like the follow-up letter. I'm like, look, I got, I'm not, I'll pay you back. I'm good for it. Right. And I didn't realize that you had to make the minimum payment. So like three months later, I'm getting like calls from, you know, people hunting me down and stuff like this, like saying, you have to pay the minimum payment. And I actually thought it, it wasn't that I didn't have the money. I thought I was doing the right thing. Cause I thought, no, like why would someone want $10 when I can just, they can wait two months. I can pay them the whole amount back. And so that three month mistake actually destroyed my credit for like the next seven years where I couldn't get a loan, couldn't get, and I, I had no clue. I didn't know what, it wasn't like, it wasn't, I didn't have the money or didn't have the opportunity to pay it back. I just didn't understand. And I think so many people walk out of our education systems, not having that knowledge, not having that understanding. Right. And I think that's something that we need to, no, I, I, I don't need, like, sometimes I don't know, like it took me a long time as an adult and my own personal, like willingness to go and search on that, to kind of figure that out. And so I don't know if we're really helping kids with that right now either. We're, we're, we're not, because again, most States do not require a financial literacy, personal finance course. Now they'll, right. most States require a, a foreign language requirement, but they don't right. do that for, uh, personal finances for kids on again hmm. understanding how you open up a checking account uh budgeting saving uh, investing and credit like you have to understand that like you know even as an adult you know my wife and i and she was the one that sort of started it in in, in family about okay we're going to take care of these debts we're going to do this we're going to do that right and, you know, now, you know, not telling, you know, I want to put my business out there, but, you know, but now, you know, I, you know, we're sitting on some, some, some nice situations over here because right. we started to be focused on saying, yeah. we're not going to be carrying this type of debt. 
Uh, we're going to be focused on saving and we're going to be, you know, again, why do you spend? Right. Right. Like just because y- you got some thousands in the bank doesn't mean you need to go spend some thousands, you know, right. you know, so, and, and you know, even like with the consulting work that I do, like this summer, I didn't spend any of that money. Right. That money went straight into the bank because I'm like, I got a financial goal mm-hmm. that I'm, that I am trying uh, to reach. And so, okay, I'm coming in and even, you know, I talked to the wife. I said, okay, if there's some things that we want to do, then let's break up our savings this way. This percentage of savings goes here, never touched. We can say this percentage can be towards, okay, you want to take a big trip, that big trip are there. But also understand what if when, when certain big money is going out, mm-hmm. it, it needs to be replaced. If not, you're not really saving anything. And that's where right. the consulting, the writing, the other stuff, you know, comes in, even the, the sales of the documentary of, okay, we got to try to bring in these extra right. I- income in, uh, be, because I don't do it because I, you know, I want a Bugatti, you know, I, I do it because I don't want to be in a situation where I need it and I ain't got it. Right. Yeah. And I, go ahead. I, I, I like there's, um, there's, I, I, I've, I've always, I thought about doing this at some point doing like, uh, um, a get rich slow course. Right. Cause like, like, I think people want to like, if I don't get money right now, then, you know, but actually it does take time to kind of like build, you know, financial literacy, uh, in that aspect of it too. And it does take some discipline, but I think there's ways you can, you can do certain things where, um, you don't even notice, right? Like for example, where you just basically get X amount taken off a paycheck mm-hmm. and that automatically goes, and then you just don't even count on that money. Right. Cause that's like, it's like spent money that's going somewhere else and that's automatically investing. Right. And I think like with, uh, things like if you're in the U S using Robin hood, doing like fractional shares, if you're Canada doing well, simple trade, um, doing that stuff too. And just kind of going through that. Cause I didn't really understand it. And, I, you know, um, there is a book. I actually have it right beside me. Have you ever read this book? Money by Tony Robbins. Have you ever read this book? I have not. It's good. It's so actually I'll show it. I actually have it right beside me. Uh, it, it's pretty thick book and probably the first, like they just kind of first three or four chapters. It's like, just kind of like, just say the same thing over and over again, but there's some really good tips in there. And I had to like, kind of, tr- I, it's weird because I had to translate it from American to Canadian because he's like talking about things. I'm like, that doesn't exist in Canada. So I, what does that mean here? Um, but yeah, like it, it is kind of a uh, an interesting thing that I don't necessarily think we focus on because, you know, as, um, as you know, when I first started teaching, you're just kind of dependent on your pension, right? You're dependent mm-hmm. on that, that pension. So like if you were to give um, and, and, I, and, and maybe like if anyone's listening, if you're watching this on YouTube, throw in some of your questions in the comments. I'd, lo- I'd love to hear them too. Um, you know, and maybe there's, there's a, a follow-up podcast on this, but um, I think people are, you know, a lot of maybe educators are, you know, c- you know, understand their mortgage bills and all that other stuff. But like, how, how do you, what, like, if you're saying like, Hey, to kind of take that next step, like what would be a first focus that you'd give to, you know, people that are listening to this podcast to, you know, kind of build that up to, so that they're not just kind of living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you got to, you got to save and you got to be like focused on saving money. Right. And when it's away, it's away. Don't just sit up right. there. And because you look there and you look, okay, I got $10,000 saved up. Now I can go to Hawaii. N- no, right. that's not Hawaii money. <laughs> right. That's not Hawaii right, money. Right, right, right. You want to go to Hawaii uh, start up, start a business, yeah, or invest and take some of the money from from uh, that and go to Hawaii. But you need to be very diligent and and saving, right? And then you know, allow yourself to to live. You know, I'm not I'm not one of those fire people. You know, allow yourself to live, but be reasonable, right? You know I'm saying we, we, we live, right? And 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 so that means hey, yeah, go out and eat, you know, whatever, but. We we're not talking about we're gonna blow this up every weekend, you know. Right, uh right. and again, keep your credit right. Now, yeah. cash is king, but credit is queen. <laughs> and so it, it you can have five million dollars in the bank, but if your credit is garbage, you're in trouble. Right. Right. Shannon Sharp. I don't know if anyone uh 
I do. Was, all right. So Shannon Sharp used to be an NBA, yeah. NFL player, and he was on this podcast called uh, Needing the Dough, which this podcast is all about professional athletes and their money journey and, mm. and, and financial literacy and all that stuff, right? And he talked about how he was in the NFL making NFL money and needed a co-signer for a car because oh, wow. he had bad credit. Really? Yes. Now imagine you're in the NFL. Right. You're going to the car dealership. Those people see you play on Sunday. Right? These people might not they got to know, okay, this is Shannon Sharp. He got some mm-hmm. money. Mm-hmm. Right? But they can't give him a car. Right. Because his credit will will not allow him to finance it. So he had to get a co-signer to do that. And so that's why I say cash is king because cash is always great. Right. But the credit is, credit is queen because without it, the cash means nothing. Right. Because when you need something financed. Yeah. Right. And most people will finance, you know, car, a house, you know, type, type of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why, the, you know, you need the good credit for that. And part of that, again, is making sure you understand what credit means. And it does not, you know, mean I'm going to pay my minimum for 40 years. You know, you want to, I mean, that's great for consecutive payments, but pay stuff off, pay it down because there is something called a debt to income ratio. Yeah. And you want your, you want that as a certain percentage. Uh, So when you go that, that, Factors right. into your credit score and all those things, right? So you you need to understand credit, how that works, and make sure you're on top of your payments and all those things. Check it out your credit report. Make sure there's nothing crazy on there. Uh, check your bank account regularly, too, as well, b- because you want to make sure, again, nothing, because we swipe the card all the time, you want to make sure no one has also gotten your your number to do some swiping, some some online shopping. Right, well. so, right, right. Uh, you know, check that often. Make sure, oh, I, I didn't charge that. We'll call your bank. Uh, so, you know, that's the thing. First of all, you just got to, you got to save. You got to put a certain percentage of your check away every month. Right. And when that money is gone, it is gone. It no longer exists as far right. as I'm concerned, right? right? Don't even think about, I got it. No, you don't have it. It's, it's there. Gone. Right. Right. That is strictly for emergency yep. and retirement. Right. Right. And so when I say emergency is your engine goes out of your car and you need three thousand dollars to get that fixed. OK, now go. OK, dip into that. Outside of that, you let that money sit there. And then again, keep your, your credit on point and making sure that you're there and then look for assets right mm-hmm. think about when you you're, you're you're spending your money what is an asset wasn't a lot what is a liability mm-hmm. and so at some point uh buy the house and i know not everyone wants to be a homeowner and you may that just mean for you then you might just want to buy a townhouse or a condo or something small right but buy the house because that is an asset with, right. which normally will appreciate which you can go back and draw equity from and something that you can again pass down to your children, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, and once you pay that off, if you say, hey, you know, whatever, maybe you can rent that thing out, Airbnb, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But the problem with rent, uh, and I don't want to have this rent, but you don't own it and your rent can go up every year if your landlord so decides to do so. Right. And either you will stay and pay the increase or you'll just go find somewhere else to stay, but you don't control right what happens there right and right. so look at that what is an asset what is a liability a, a brand new car is a liability because as soon as you drive it off the lot it depreciates in value so right with me i was fine okay let me get me a really good used car low mileage because i understand that i need my stuff to be an investment and, no, and yeah. nothing that is going to tie me down financially and it's going to be a hindrance to my growth and, and that's why I think educators, again, need to be thinking about the whole money aspect of we know our salary from our district is going to be limited. Right. And the only way normally for us to get more, get a, a bigger job, right. to get more money, you got to get another degree, which means more debt for a lot of folks. Yep. 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 Right. So Definitely. we're behind the eight ball period <laughs> from the from the jump. 
Well, yeah, and this is this is a, and I'm going to ask you about uh, your documentary because I think people are going to be interested in, in checking that out. But the um, one one piece of advice I'd give to people, and I, I want people to think about this. There's a lot of, um, and I know we both work in this space. There's a lot of educational technology companies, right? And they look for like ambassadors, and they'll give you free swag and all this yeah. other stuff. They're they're in it to make money. Yes. Okay? They're in it to, and a lot of them are in it to create a certain space that eventually they get bought out for millions, if not billions of dollars, right? And then what they do, and I, I, I'm giving, again, maybe a truth bomb here that I might get in trouble for, but they'll like, they'll use the kindness of teachers to like, hey, wear our shirt, promote our product, talk about it on Twitter, do this, do this, and we'll give you like, we'll, we'll pay your way here. We'll do this too. I don't for me don't ever they're they're coming to you if they come to you and ask you for that they're they're making money so like be saying like hey like yeah so what would be my compensation for providing this for you and then just remember they're a business right and the, you know even if they're saying they're non-profit it's not non-money it's there's a different right those are two different things so just be cognizant because a lot of times it's like companies will take advantage of teachers I, I feel because teachers are kind of used to not getting paid well. And then they just are like, Oh, I got a free shirt out of it. Or, you know, like I, you know, they, they, they paid for my conference or things like that too. So I, I just, just be cognizant and, you know, cause it is your reputation that's connected to it. It's your name, it's your work, it's your years of experience that are connected to this. Right. And so I'm going to ask you this and I like, I, I said, this is going to be between 30 and 45 minutes. And I'm like, if we're keeping under an hour, I'd be amazed right now. Cause I, I know a lot of people are gonna be interested in, you know, some of this stuff too. Um, you, you did a, a, a documentary on, uh, it's called the Edupreneur, and you can actually yes, see it linked in uh, the description down below. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what that is and, you know, tell us a little bit about, I actually, I'm curious, not only about the documentary, but even just the thought of making it like how was that process for you so we'd love to hear about it it was awesome let me, let me before i do that let me touch on what you just said because i love what yeah. you said george listen people do not become an ambassador <laughs> for any of these companies right i have told teachers do not become an ambassador you will not see me with any device with a sticker on it you don't yep. see me with a t-shirt you don't see me repping anything because i don't get paid i, I was the first geg uh, Mississippi leader. And I was so excited about it. Mm -hmm. Right. It, I, I, it was like uh, a great anatomy. The audience was GEG. A uh, Google education group. And okay. they have these for e each state. Right. Right. And then they have these uh, for countries abroad. And I was so excited. You know, it was kind of like a great anatomy. Pick me, choose me. Right. I was like, I was right. very excited about it. Right. And they wanted us every month to put on some event. It could be face-to-face, -face, it could be virtual. Right. And then you had to submit documentation right. of what you did, right? right? And if you didn't, you you would get an email from Google saying, hey, uh -huh, we didn't get anything. And I got to a point where I'm right. saying like, y'all ain't paying me nothing, right. but I'm doing this for you. right? So I gave it up, Yeah. right? And then that's the same thing when I talk to educators in general, I tell them, if you are going to be doing something for a company, you need to be doing something because you're getting a check or the relationship as, as, as such that this is starting to move into another direction to, to get you something else. Right. Right. And so earlier for me with Schoology, I was a Schoology ambassador and I made a lot of different relationships with people. And I was very yeah. uh, aware and very intentional in what I was doing. Right. And, they that relationship paid off because someone from Tech Edge magazine reached out to Schoology about we want we want to talk about Schoology and what, what can be done uh, in in the classroom at the school, and the people at the time were like, you don't want to interview us, you want to interview Dr. Will, right? So that person interviewed me. We had a great time, and then that person reached back out to me and said, I want you to write an article for Tech Edge magazine for pay, right? And that started me starting to write for publications right. for money. But again, I was very intentional about this, right? And I only did, I, I was only ambassador for about three or four years. And then I stepped away because again, I'm not here for my genius, right? right? Now, 
in some circles, Dr. Will is famous. Now, I'm not George Kuro's famous, <laughs> but in some circles, I'm famous. Now, what that means is, as George talked about earlier, is when I'm on Twitter and mm-hmm. I'm tweeting or I'm talking through my podcast or I'm on Instagram, I have a certain influence over a certain amount of educators. So right. if I'm out there talking about a learning management system, some sort of educational program, et cetera, that means that company has access to the people who follow me, the access to right. the people who think right. I'm worthy of listening to. Right. Right. And so if you're not going to be paid for it because they're going to be paid for it. Right. Then yep. you should not be doing that. So that's or oh, I'm going to I just want to throw that out there. So if you brought that up is do not trade your name, your right. expertise, your following, your time for an ed tech company that is going to get paid, but not going to pay you. Yeah. And I, so there, the, for me, there is a little bit, there's a little bit of a distinction. I have very, and I've talked to people about this that kind of work in these spaces is that I, if I will say like, Hey, I really like this product. It's not because they're paying me. It's because I like the product. But if they, if a group comes to me and says, we'll pay you. And I know this is like, I'll say like, Hey, like I'll talk about what I talk about. But if I just say I like you because you paid me and anyone finds that out, then it makes then it, then people will not trust what I'm saying. Right. So it's like you're giving up your reputation mm-hmm. to get, you know, minimal pay. And you might actually get the minimal pay now, but long term, it will actually hurt your credibility. So like okay. um, like I, I actually there's there's products that like and, you know, like there, I think you have to if if you, and I'm not saying don't ever, um, you know, like if a, a company comes to you and says that. You have to just like I think it's I think you have to kind of disclose. That. I don't know if it, what the rules are in Twitter or anything like that too, but like if you, for me, when I share like, hey, I like this thing, I'm very caught. Like it's because I actually like the thing, and I think that that to me is an important thing. That when I connect my name to stuff, that I'm important, not because they paid or reached out to me. And I actually had a company years ago said, Hey, we love that you promote our stuff. Like if we can get you to do this, I said, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. I, I promote you because I like you, but I don't want to, as soon as you start paying me, then it's going to look fake. Right. And I think like being thought of that too, but there is a long-term connection to that. So I appreciate you making that distinction. Cause, and I'm glad, I'm glad we're on the same page with that too, because I don't, I don't know if everyone else is too, be it, but I just want people to kind of think about that, what, what it does long-term. So let's get back to the edupreneur. Let's get back to the entrepreneur. So tell yeah. us about the documentary that you created. Well, the, the the whole idea of making a documentary was the brainchild of uh, Dr. Uh, Sarah uh, Thomas. Uh, I had her on my show. Yeah. And y'all know who she is. Again, she's big. She's been on the big, show too. Yeah. Bigger name than I am, y'all. Look, I'm just at the bottom totem pole right at this point. Uh, uh, she was on my show and we were talking about, again, on my podcast about how do educators get out there and monetize their talents. Right. And so we were talking on her show. I'm talking to talking on my show. And then after the show, we stopped recording. I said, Hey doc, I said, you know, you're my homie. I said, I would love to work with you on edge match. I said, but I I don't have a book in me. And she said, why don't you do a documentary? I said, what what are you talking about? She said, you're already doing these interviews. You could, do a series of interviews and we thread them together to tell a single story. And I said, Oh, I never thought about that. I said, that's fantastic. And so she sent me over a proposal. And the first thing that went to my mind was the, the work that I do. Right. Um, Mm. But I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I got to tell this other story. I got to tell this, this, this other story. And I submitted her the proposal there and told her these are the people that I want to work with. And she accepted it. You know, I got my contract and signed it. And then I had to, you know, do my waivers, uh, the agreements for the right. uh, people who said they're going to be in it. And then I set up, a, you know, I, I came up with a set of questions. I shared them with, with Doc. And then from there, I just started to have these interviews with these different people. And I was like, yo, this is this is like some this is great. I knew my, my first one was Angela Myers. And when Angela said, uh, and it's in actually in the documentary, how she had had back surgery and she was gonna be out for six weeks. And now she had to figure out how to make up that missed income. Yeah. When she said that, I said, Oh, this is gonna be good. I said, yeah. because because people are starting to share stuff. I said, yeah. Oh yeah. So it's gonna be good. 
And that was my thing was I wanted to speak to people who I knew were living that life. Yeah. Right. Who they were working, they were traveling, they were doing all these things. And I wanted to get their gems and, and their knowledge, their experiences of what is it like to be an educator, entrepreneur. Uh, and they talked about family life, you know, balance. They talked about branding. They talked about sort of finding your own thing, your own lane. They talked about the work that we're doing and, and sort of how all of that sort of uh, uh, panned out from oh, here. I was as an educator and now I'm doing this and sort of giving people the idea because you can see an Eric on stage. Right. But not know what that life is like when you're on the road that much. Right. But when you watch the documentary, you find out. Right. Right. And you find out all the work that goes behind the person you see as Eric Schinniger. Mm-hmm. And and so I wanted that documentary to come out. So for those individuals who are out there thinking about doing this thing, that they have a better idea of what does this really look like? Because there's a difference between you having a one offer where, where, where I do a couple of these things a year and it doesn't have any real impact on my life mm-hmm. versus those who are really getting paid. Now your, 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 your family life is, is right. impacted. Your professional life can be impacted because at some point in time, when the, when the gigs keep coming and coming and coming and coming and coming and coming, you have to ask yourself, mm-hmm. is this, I do, I want to do this full time. Is this the work that I want to do? Right. Or do I want to stay at the school district? Cause you can't stay at the school district and have that many jobs. Cause no one has that many personal days. Right. Right. And so at some point in time, you have to figure out, what my what's my next step and so all of that was in is, is in the documentary and i was so excited to tell it because i'm always telling educators to monetize their talents because mm-hmm. it's okay for us to work at retail we know a lot of ed- educators that work at retail they'll tour yeah. they'll do all these things yeah but when you can do what you love right so if you love teaching you love coaching you love all these things when you can do that and make an impact outside of the four walls of your classroom and get paid for it and get paid well again i I'm, when i say i'm i'm here i know what i'm getting paid compared mm-hmm. to some of my homies and even when i get my check i'm like this is i make more i get make more money in a day in a day that I make my whole month in my school district. Mm. And I already know that even what I'm getting paid is not what others are getting paid. Right. And so when I look at that and I go, Oh my goodness, that, and it, again, we're talking about financial literacy and all this stuff that blew right. I mean, dude, that blew my mind when I got my first check ever. And I'm like, Oh, say really? And so, uh, when I, I look at all those things and I'm thinking creating multiple streams of income, you know, making things better for you mm-hmm. uh, and, and your family. And, yep. and, uh, and, and if there's something, you know, a charity or something you want to, you know, drop $500, a thousand dollars for, yo, you got that money, you know, you can do that, you know, right. easily, you know? So, uh, that's where the whole idea of it was, was just to share their stories, uh, because we were all, we were in a situation now more educators are sort of openly kind of talking about it. But at a, at a time, it was like very hush-hush. Like nobody right. wanted to talk about it. They want to talk about the money. And I still don't ask people their salaries. Now they volunteer, they volunteer. But I don't, you know, but it's, when you hear these things and you see all this stuff, it, you know, a lot of people are like, and then there was pushback, right? I had one dude even ask me on Voxer. He said, Will, you keep talking about this money. Is, is there anything you won't do for money? And I, I had to, you know. Right. That just say that conversation. I had to handle that like a man, but uh, you know, because you don't come at me like that. Uh, well, you, get, you know, I think I think sometimes people get they they get like it's it's a lot of times like if we're being honest, sometimes it's insecurity maybe because they're in a different situation. And that's and I you know I've been in that space too. Um, the reality at the end of the day, you have to take care of your family. I have to take care of my family. That's to me. That's always my number one. That's always my number one. Is you know my family. Uh, yeah. and, and care about that. And I think sometimes, you know, uh, there's a, um, there's a, yeah, I just, there's something I, I, I think about. I, I, I appreciate that you're talking about this because I don't know if people do. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the, 
the documentary too. So, and uh, th like, I know people are going to be interested in this too. So if you can check out on the link uh, below, um, you can see Dr. Will, I think there's a trailer and then you can actually purchase the, you can actually purchase it. Yeah. And it has it listed in Canadian dollars on my website. So just so you know, <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if it changes with a, with, with a currency change every day. I wonder if it, like, I, I actually see like it shows that the CA. So it's kind of uh, interesting there too. So like if somebody was to, maybe start like doing something like this like yeah what do you do you have a first step for them i i don't want to i actually like i'm kind of like i want to do a little bit of a teaser too i don't want them to know too much about the documentary i want them to watch it so yeah. um what's the what's like a first step if they're looking to like you know you know maybe have like an extra stream of income like what, what would you suggest as a first step well the first thing is that you have to recognize that you are a business mm -hmm. right because the mindset of doing this is not the same mindset as being an employee. Right. And so once you are over that and over the whole idea of getting paid for this work, right. Uh, then you have to figure out what you do well and what lane you're going to occupy because right. you need to, you know, cause you got to be very specific in what you're doing. You, you can't be one of those people that on your website, you got like, I do this, 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 and this. No, you don't. Right. 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 <laughs> you right. don't, you don't really do all that. Uh, you know, that's why I love uh Dr. Catelyn Tucker. She is blended learning. Yep. No one confuses her with anything else. We know that's blended learning, that's teaching online. Yep. Uh, that's it. And and yep. that's what you you want to have that sort of name re recognition because you, you need to have a certain expertise that you know, right? As they say in the streets, you got to have receipts. Right. You know, like even when the pandemic hit, you know, there were some people all of a sudden on Twitter talking about online learning. And I'm like, I've never heard you talk about online right. learning pre pandemic. Right. Why are you in these streets talking about it right now? Right. And some folks actually got jobs mm -hmm. doing that. I said, oh, my goodness. I didn't like that, though. But, you know, hey, you're getting paid. It's all good on me. But, you know. Right. You, you got again, you got to figure that thing out and then you got to make sure that it fits the marketplace. Right. So just yeah. because you're excited about something, are people willing to pay for it? Right. Right. And then, of course, you got to educate yourself on the business piece. Right. You got to find you a CPA, a CPA. People don't go to H&R Block. <laughs> you, need a, you, you need a CPA because you need someone who not only knows the tax code, but someone who's going right. to educate you to what are deductions. So right. every so every year going in, you know, if I make this purchase of this iPad because I'm going to be making these tutorials that you can go ahead and deduct right. that iPad. Right. So uh, being educated on that level, understanding your bank account. Uh, are you going to incorporate? Uh, because sometimes it works best to be a sole proprietor versus an LLC, et cetera. Uh, and also, you know, get you some insurance. I got insurance. Mm -hmm. Now, I've never had anyone come back to me and say, you didn't deliver on your promise. We want our money back or we're going to mm -hmm. sue you. Right. But I have insurance just in case. Right. 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 Got a couple of meals sitting back. Well, I, well that's the policy. But, but just <laughs> just in case, uh, you know, if I had a couple of meals. Right. I don't know if I was, I was still working at my school district because I'm because I got it. Don't mean I don't need to be working. But right. I, you know, you, you make sure your business is cold. Mm -hmm. You know, and understand the tax piece, man, because you get excited and get that ten thousand dollar check from that school district. But they didn't take out one penny. Right. Right. Now, I don't know about Canada, but I know when it, when it comes to the United States, they say death and taxes are real. So they're right. coming for that money. Taxes are real. Taxes are real in Canada. <laughs> they're uh, way worse in Canada. Hey, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to we, we could go on forever because yes, I, 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 I'm going to because I promise this will be a 45 minutes and I'm probably like, I don't know what I'm taking away from you right now. But the one thing that you said that I think is really, really important is I, I, I figure out the thing that you love. Right. Yeah. And I think that the 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 beautiful thing, because I because I, I've I, I've seen the trend chasing, too. Like, I, I know what you're talking about with that. And like people know me for innovation. Right. And that's what I talk about. And that's what I love. And I feel there's always going to be an audience for that um, to some somewhere. Right. And what's beautiful about the time that we live in, if you are in to like cursive handwriting, there is like a there's probably like a crazy 
a cursive handwriting community somewhere that will pay you to talk about it, right? Like there, there, it, that's the, one of the really cool things about the world we live in today. And I think it's something that we got to talk about more with our kids is that like, there's always like these really, you know, like, like to think that, you know, there's kids who play video games for literally millions of dollars, right? And that's, that's a job. Now that's an opportunity for, for, you know, some of our students from some adults, you know, um, that didn't exist before. And so it, I, I find that that's you, if you, if you, if you ch look up keywords and you tra chase trends, and then I feel that you might kind of get something maybe mo like momentarily, but people are going to actually, cause people can sniff out who's not authentic and not. But if you find the thing that you love and you focus on that, you there's opportunities is it, you just you just have to kind of go look for it that's something i think is is great advice that you give so well I, I dr will i love talking about this and i'm sure and i'd love to you know if you have any questions uh for myself dr will just actually post it down in uh youtube uh it'd be interesting kind of I, i'm looking forward to releasing this podcast but uh, I, I highly encourage people to check out your documentary entrepreneur and uh, you can see links to will's uh podcast uh his twitter uh, down below. But Dr. Will, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It was great to sit down. How have we not connected before today? How have we not done this before? Hey, hey, you the big man. I told you I'm the low man on Totem Pop. Hey, and thanks everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I really did. So Dr. Will, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. I appreciate it.